on this edition of Native Report. We attend a special gathering on the shores of Lake Superior. We learn about one band's reintroduction of the sturgeon, a culturally important food source. And we attend a symposium addressing the protection of wild rice. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to the premiere episode of our seventh season of Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. The Mother Earth Water Walk began in 2003 on the shores of Lake Superior. Recently, water bearers walking from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, Hudson Bay, and the Gulf of Mexico gathered where it all began to bring attention to the sacred gift of water, the giver of all life. It is said that a journey begins with the first step, and on this late spring day, the journey by participants in the Mother Earth Water Walk that began hundreds of miles away is nearly complete. What we're doing in to, to raise collective awareness, collective consciousness about water's importance to life and to take care of it and really not, not, not sell it off. It's uh, very important to, as a grandmother, as a mother, as a, as a child there, that uh, I didn't want any any expense on, on any of my children, my grandchildren, next generations to to have that kind of uh, expense or, or not to take care of the water, be taking care of the water. There's been a lot of uh, awareness now, more more so more so than before, that uh, a lot of people are being, being beginning to be aware. We met a lady from Belgium yesterday that she's she said she's they're doing water walks in her community that's in Belgium. And we've had uh, responses from Japan, from uh, from Sweden, that you know that they're aware of of the waters of the water walk. Walkers came from the four directions, meeting on the Bad River Reservation in northern Wisconsin. I had a dream about uh, the water being handed to me by a woman. She handed me water, and then she walked away without saying anything to me, and. Being of the Medeowin Three Fires Lodge, I understood my connection to the water. And being at Shingwak in Amagewikamik and part of the Three Fires Lodge, I knew Bidasike, Josephine Mendaman, and her work for the water. And so I, I sat with her and I told her my dream. And um, she encouraged me to get involved with the Western walkers. And I was at Shingwak, we were still in session. So I didn't leave to um, set any steps down myself, but I coordinated for the West and I got to carry the water. Just a little bit of the ways in today, that was my first carrying of the water, even though I've been with the West for more than two months now. We walked through, uh, started on the Squamish territory and uh, went through Yakima, Spokane, Flathead and the Blackfoot territory and just meeting the youth and just you know speaking with them and asking them what the water means to them. Um, I mean, they're the, the future generations. And so, you know, I wanted to share with them what's going on in my community and, and you know, just kind of explaining to them the, the importance of their role and for them to just kind of observe on the walk what our grandmothers are doing. They're sending that message on, on our duties into the future. And so it was a great honor for me to, to meet different uh, youth in different nations and uh, I guess really acknowledging the water in different territories was really important for me too. Um, I thought about the water in my community, but uh, for me to give prayers for the other waters in the communities um, really touched me because it, it left a, a footprint in me. When I think about water, I think it on a, on a wider scale um, and send prayers out there too. I mean, one of the things when we met some of the youth, they were talking about how important 
um, the water is and it, it feeds other communities. It's not just their community, it goes down for miles, maybe across the state. And so that we need to think about that, that wherever we are along the water, we have that responsibility for us to take care of the water and that just passes down. It was on the shores of Lake Superior where the walk reached its end, but it was also a new beginning. We are now bringing the, the, four, the four directions waters that we have orphaned and that we, are, we have considered them now they are one family, they are no longer orphans anymore, mm. they are one family. I would like to tell the young people to go out to the bush and, and go and rest and, on Mother Earth for a few days and be without food and water. And then they realize how important it is to be without food and water. The water is very precious. Growing up we were without water many times in two, two places where we lived. We didn't have water or well. We had to, we had to go to neighbors, neighbors' well to go and get the water, which was very difficult. And then we moved to another place where there was a lake. So that was where we, where we uh, grew up as teenagers and that was the best, best part of our lives is to be with water, to swim in the summertime. It was beautiful. So I know what it's like to be without water. I wanted to find a, a peaceful way to raise awareness and hopefully inspire other people to, to think about how they use water and to think, you know, it's not so much about commodities, it's about preserving the water because there's a, there's a cycle of life and we have to sustain that. We have a responsibility um, to that and so I went across uh, to Washington and met a lot of different uh, people from the surrounding areas. and and we, we shared stories about water in our community and really talked about the pollution in our communities and something, it's something that's abundant, I guess, the pollution in uh, Indigenous communities in Turtle Island and so it's something, this walk was really important for us to come together and, and to talk about that and, you know, put our minds together and our hearts together and say, you know, what can we do? And this is something that we, that we can do and this is Josephine is, is uh, walking the talk and really what it was all about. I wanted to, I wanted to do something instead of it sitting somewhere and people having discussions and it not going anywhere. So this has brought together a lot of people and so I think this is what the best way to raise awareness. So I think that was the, the best part, building, building relations and building families and friends and some, that'll be something that'll last for a, a lifetime. This gathering brought many people, cultures, and religious beliefs together as one, united with the water. There were so many walkers, we had teams out, and it was a far ways, and the communities that were, were just amazing, all the way through every nation, original peoples, they stood up, they hosted our walkers, they walked them in, they fed them traditional foods that that would energize our walkers and keep them strong. And they welcomed them into the long houses. They prayed for them, they sang for them, and they really lightened their steps. And it just fills my heart so much to see us taking up our responsibilities as people. I'd like to see that uh, the corporations being more aware of, be, be conscious of, of what they're doing to the water, how they're wasting it, and is there any other ways that they can they need to come and talk to us and we can, we can tell them what suggestions we would, we would have for them. But they're not coming to us and we would like to have them come, come and speak to us about how, what better ways there are to, to take care of the water. Did you know sturgeon appear in a tribal legend? The Song of Hiawatha, written by poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, was actually based on Ojibwe stories. In it, the protagonist perceives the great sturgeon, known as the king of the fishes. Over 25 species of sturgeon are found in salt and fresh water. Freshwater sturgeon are the largest and longest lived of any freshwater fish and they are enormous when compared to other freshwater species. Mature adults average between three and five feet in length and range between 10 and 80 pounds, but can occasionally grow as large as seven plus feet, weighing in at over 300 pounds. Sturgeon belong to one of the most primitive groups of bony fishes and remain basically unchanged from when they first appeared on the scene in the Mesozoic era between 65 and 230 million years ago. 
Ojibwe legends describe a sturgeon in Lake Superior so big it was capable of swallowing a large canoe. Next, we learn about an ancient fish, the sturgeon that once thrived in the Great Lakes region and its tributaries. What originally began as a restocking program for the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa has turned into an ongoing census of this traditional food source. On this midsummer day, Survey crews from the Fond du Lac Resource Management Division and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are on Lake Superior hoping to net an elusive prey, the lake sturgeon. This is the first time that most of the agencies have set out to survey lake sturgeon in Lake Superior. Lake sturgeon have shown up in some of the other assessments, but there hasn't been a coordinated, targeted sampling for lake sturgeon it's going to be Wisconsin DNR, Michigan DNR, Minnesota DNR, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, Canadian Fisheries and Oceans, or Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and then 1854 Treaty Authority, Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, Red Cliff, Bad River, Keweenaw Bay, and Bay Mills. It's an entire lake-wide effort. Presumably as the population builds lake-wide, as well as estuary in mean, um, the St. Louis River as well. As the fish start spawning here, um, we'll be able to monitor changes, hopefully increases in recruitment and juvenile density. This survey on the Big Lake and rivers closer to and within the boundaries of the Fond du Lac Reservation is revealing positive information. I think the most interesting thing that has occurred this past year was at the base of the Fond du Lac Dam, the Fond du Lac crew went down there with fine drift nets and we actually sampled, I think, four larval sturgeon, which is the first time in over a hundred years that it has been documented that sturgeon are now using the St. Louis River for spawning. They're a bit more protected than in the wild. We're trying to give these eggs the best chance they have. This is a, a continuation of a, of a restoration project that began in the mid-90s. Uh, on the upper parts of the St. Louis River. The St. Louis River has uh, five hydroelectric dams between the Fond du Lac Reservation and the S Lake Superior. And because of that fragmentation of the river, uh, that's one of the reasons for the decline in, in sturgeon historically that were up here. We used to rely on sturgeon seasonally. It is a pretty significant resource. Basically, the, they were considered wiped out in this stretch of the river above Cloquet. And it was even debated for quite some time that they ever were up here. And so my predecessor spent quite a bit of time doing research, conducting interviews with local folks and fishermen and anyone that he could find that had a lead on that there used to be sturgeon up here. And once he was fairly comfortable with the fact that they did exist up here at one time, he started investigating source options for the for stocking. We started the sturgeon project with my other program manager back in the 90s. Larry started looking at repopulating the Upper St. Louis River system. So he went through them with a whole bunch. So I just followed Larry, went out and talked to the different agencies from Wisconsin to Minnesota, all the different DNR to find out some history on sturgeon. I think Larry was looking at the late 30s was the last time that anybody even documented anything on the Upper St. Louis River system. The field work is a day-long task, and it's not unusual for weeks to pass by without netting a sturgeon. Uh, right now I'm just getting the transmitter ready. Or not the transmitter, but the receiver ready. And this will pick up the frequency on the transmitter. The transmitter just sends out a frequency like a radio frequency. I'll dial that frequency into the receiver and that will send off some pings if he's in the area. If he's in the area it'll beep and this is a directional antenna so whatever direction you're pointing at is the direction the fish is in. Alright, right on top of him. Yep. 
Wherever a sturgeon is netted, either on an inland river or the lake, the processing of the fish is done in the same manner. We take uh, measurements off it. We record its length. Well, we take two measurements, its fork length and its total length. That's all recorded. Um, oh, yeah, for aging, take a piece of the pectoral spine and that uh, is then casted in resin and cut and then put underneath a microfish reader and that gives us age, pretty much looking at uh, rings on a tree. Pit tag and that pit tag is put into a national database. So uh, if someone was also to catch the fish and they check for pit tag, the pit tag number will come up and they can check, you know, where the fish was caught, when it was caught. We take a section of its tail fin for genetics. Last year and this year was the first year that we actually found these fish. She's looking at almost 12 year process just to be able to see what we've done 12 years ago, knowing that this system worked. And it's sort of neat to be able to follow a project from nesting boxes to now to actually be in an organization for a long-term commitment and actually see results. Ultimately, we'd like to see a, a reproducing population of, uh, you know, so we don't have to stock. That's the ultimate goal, is to have a, a fishery that we can actually, uh, our grandkids can harvest. As elders, we want to be sure that we leave something for the children, that it's not all about me or, you know, it's, it's about the community. As a, com as a people, we've always been in a communal spirit, and therefore it means that we look out for each other and we look out for everybody in your community, in your Teoshpaye. And, and I come from the Afraid of Bear Teoshpaye, and my, my line of, of, of men in my Teoshpaye were Indian police. Um, there was a man named George Sword who called himself Captain George Sword, who was first Indian police at Pine Ridge. That is my bloodline. His brother was afraid of bear, and afraid of bear had about 15 children and died. So his brother George raised all of them, and I'm from that bloodline. But my grandfather's fathers were Indian police. My great grandfather died when I was 12. His name was Robert Afraid of Bear. He was Indian police. His sons were Indian police. Their sons were Indian police, and then down to my brothers. So we're still, we still to maintain, to protect, and to serve. That's been at the heart of what we do. Native nations are striving to protect, preserve, and properly care for wild rice, which is a sacred food staple. A symposium addressing these issues has been held twice on the Wide Earth Reservation in Minnesota. The gathering also serves as an opportunity to exchange cultural teachings between Native and Western scientific worldviews. On this mid-August day, as the traditional wild rice harvest draws near, a gathering of northern Minnesota tribal nations and University of Minnesota researchers meet to discuss common interests. There has been, um, for a number of years, probably since the mid-1980s and into mid-1990s, the controversy around the issue of um, genetic altering of wild rice which is um, our sacred food. We can choose two ways, either to be adversarial and to widen the gap between tribes and university, or we can reach out and build bridges and partnerships with the university on the issue of wild rice and the research that relates to it. White Earth has chosen the relationship route to build and develop understanding and respect 
And of course, it t it's a longer process. You know, as agronomist, as I said earlier, you know, I've spent 33 years of my life dedicated to the sole purpose of, and that's why I came into higher education, because of a deep concern and deep interest in food and how food is produced and using my skills and my training to help stabilize and increase food production, not only domestically, but around the world. So I've had the vantage point of uh, my agronomic training and background to look at this issue that brings this group of folks together here t for the next three days. And it has allowed me, I think, to have a uh, more well-rounded perspective on the issues and uh, to know that uh, we're not going to always agree on the specific details, but I think it's just gratifying that we agree that collaborating is absolutely the way forward, that we have to meet, Hi, we have to have honest dialogue, and hopefully out of that will come some mutuality for the mutual benefit of everyone. An understanding of the cultural importance of wild rice is demonstrated at a rice camp, which proved very popular at the first symposium and also provided inspiration for a possible collaboration. Ten years ago, the relationships were really pretty, pretty poor. But it seemed to me that uh, the story was so important, the need for better understanding was so important that uh, we really began working in earnest to uh, develop ways to be more effective working with the administration at the university. Uh, and in that regard, what we really began was a strong partnership with tribal leadership and bringing students up uh, initially to build that relationship to a mini wild rice camp where students began uh, really experiencing the rice camp and seeing what the value was to the community since it was all taught by elders. Um, and then using the leverage or just the, the ability for students to talk about how important it clearly was to them to help shape the administration's opinion and uh, resulted two years ago finally in uh, the first Wild Rice Symposium. And the outcome of that as we look at it this year and the set of recommendations that were forwarded to the tribe were, I think, a powerful statement to the fact that work, good work can be done. The idea is to create real collaborative partnerships as opposed to relationships where Anishinaabeg people or wild rice is, is an object, but instead we want to create real partnerships. And one of the ideas that has surfaced is the idea of a Nibi Center or a water research center and that that might be one place that Anishinaabeg people and the university can start collaborating and looking at um, the importance of water, environmental factors, pollution, those types of things, and then including also cultural viewpoints, how we as Anishinaabeg people view water and how that might add to the, converse, to the scientific conversation so that those conversations aren't necessarily in conflict, but they can actually complement each other. Another idea that sprang from the first event is a white paper entitled Preserving the Integrity of Monoman in Minnesota. So the white paper essentially delineates the Anishinaabe stance on monoman or wild rice. What does wild rice mean to us as people? Why it's important? How it relates to our prophecies? Um, cultural importance, economic importance, and legal importance relating to treaty rights as well. We have a number of issues, a number of points in the white paper on collaboration, on input, on um, and ultimately it is our hope to have a memorandum of understanding signed by tribes and the university on how research will be conducted when it impacts us as indigenous people. We certainly hope that this gathering around the white paper uh, that uh, Chairwoman Visner has, uh, has created around uh, this issue is very, very important to the university community. The future of university working with Indian tribe is really uh, um, is embodied in, in, in these last two symposium. I think that's a very good example of how we will continue to engage and work together as partners, uh, where we will have what I call that critical, sometimes difficult dialogue, but authentic dialogue where different perspectives will be shared, where our perspective on the issue of research and uh, what we should research and what type of research should be done. And then uh, 
uh, the American Indian community can share their views on different issues as well. And from all of that should come a new way of, of understanding mutual respect for each other. We are not just today's Indians who have this uh, protection of wild rice. It, our, our rights go back to the treaty era. And prior to that, to when we were in control of all the land and resources here and took properly care of it. And that continues on today. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, you can find us on nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for watching and spending this time with your friends and neighbors on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. <laughs>